Hi there, me again, your friendly neighborhood humble stroke salter. So we're just going to do a video, Crash and I. Um, I'm going to do the video. He might be slightly annoying. Uh, he's in a preening mood right now. So we're going to discuss um, your second stroke. Now, I've not had another stroke. I've only had one. That was in June. It is now almost April. So a couple of people I know personally have had second or third strokes. Um, some people I know think they might have been having another event, so they've recently gone to emergency. So let's just talk about having another stroke. So first off, I'm not a doctor. I've only played one on TV. You can consider this medical information and advice, but it's nowhere near considered to be treatment or diagnostic material or any of that silliness. So. If anything I say resonates with you, I'm going to implore you to immediately either book an appointment with your general practitioner, meaning your family doctor, book an appointment with your neurologist, or if you really feel a sense of anxiety and alert after this, go to your nearest emergency center, right, and in a hospital and have them take care of you. So the data I'm going to give you is a mixture of Canadian and American data. I'll let you know what is where. I'll also include in the links down below. Uh, the research I've done so you can read uh, where I've gotten some of my data from. So once you've had stroke number one, you're now at a greater risk for stroke number two, right? Um, you notice I didn't reverse that because that's a bad thing in certain countries. So now then, there is good information that says 80% of the secondary or follow-on strokes are preventable and we'll get into that in the last part of the video about managing your risk factors and, and preventing or increasing your prevention possibilities right so I'm gonna give you some American data first approximately 795,000 Americans experience a stroke every year right three-quarters of a million people about 185,000 of those are reoccurrent stroke at least one in four 25 to 35 percent of that 795,000 um, will have a stroke again in their lifetime. So if you've had your, so for example, if I was an American and I was part of that 795,000, there's a good potentiality, one in four, 25 to 35% chance that within, between the day I've had my first stroke and the end of my life, I will have one more stroke, right? Uh, the risk factors for the first five years post-stroke you're at more than 40% chance of having another one. So if you've had your first stroke, there is a good likelihood you may have a second one. Um, reoccurrent strokes often have a higher rate of death and disability because you've already got brain damage, right? Um, a stroke is a brain injury. Because of your stroke, you're going to have some brain damage. Because of the brain damage you've achieved due to the first stroke, the follow-on stroke may or may not impact the exact same portion, uh, may or may not impact the exact same side, um, and typically may be worse. Right? Now, again, I'm not giving you this information to scare you. I'm giving this information so that you're armed and prepared and you can defend yourself effectively uh, and prepare yourself effectively for what may happen, right? And I'll be honest, it is a huge thing that just scares the shit out of me. And some of my fellow stroke folk, I was having a conversation via text with a friend of mine uh, that's in the States. They were having some issues. They were wondering, and I'm like, go to Emerge. Like, if you question anything, just go to Emerge, right? Um, and ultimately, if you've already had one stroke and you think things are happening that are a bit wonky, go to emerge. I've been there one, one night, many months ago, I had a headache that just wouldn't stop. And I took everything I had in a medicine cabinet that might abate that headache. It didn't work. And I went into emerge and I said, listen, I've had a stroke. I have a headache. That's like a nine. You need to help me. All right. So within five years of your first stroke, 24% of women and 42% of men will have a follow on stroke. Right. And again, this isn't information that's designed to scare you. It's information that's designed to let you be informed. Right? 
So after a person experiences a stroke or many stroke also maybe known as a TIA, the likelihood of them having another one is significant. The risk is highest in the first year. In the first year of having your stroke, you're now 15 times greater um, at having another one. So the first year is literally the most critical period. Now we've talked before about the first six months, six weeks, and first 12 months after your stroke, and how that's there for your best uh, rehabilitation, reintegration, and redevelopment period. You also have to consider it's the first year where you're doing all of that healing, right? Um, so there is, you know, you're you're at a light, higher likelihood, right? And so due to due to the fact that the first year is pretty much the most important, and in some cases the most temperamental, right? You have to worry about what can happen. Also, there is a significant likelihood of some complications occurring within the first 90 days after your stroke, right? Now, I'm again not trying to scare anyone. I'm just trying to make sure everyone has information so that they know what to look for. And I'm not trying to say henny penny, the sky is falling, you know. I'm just trying to say that just be aware, right? If you can recognize what is going on around you, and I realize once you've had your stroke, you're, you've got to relearn your body. You've got to relearn how you and your body interact. You've got to relearn so many things about yourself. Um, for example, right after your stroke, you're going to be incredibly fatigued, incredibly fatigued. Uh, right after your stroke, you might be easily confused. Right after your stroke, you might not have an appetite. Right after your stroke, you might have vision problems. Right after your stroke, you might have mobility problems. Right after your stroke, you might have rather egregious and wicked headache. So you're now going to have to set that as your new baseline to make any new judgments off. Have things just gotten shittier? Have things just gotten worse? Does this mean I need to go to a merge? So at that point, you need to consider um, what you're going to do and how you're going to help yourself. So in Sunnybrook, that's in Canada, um, they published a Canadian Medical Association journal um, that even people that are initially considered stable in the medical community in the hospital are at a long-term risk for follow-on strokes. Right? Even for someone who survives a stroke and initially appears to be free of complication, the risk of another stroke or possibly a heart attack um, is doubled in the first five years. Now that's doubled from the general population, right? So whatever your risk would be in the general population, and we'll get into risk factors later, you're, you're now double that, right? So, and there is a study done here in the province of Ontario, because I'm in Ontario and Canada, that 26,366 patients who had been discharged from regional stroke centers in Ontario between July 2003 and March 2013 after having had a stroke or a TIA without complications in the first 90 days. These cases were matched with 263,660 control participant that those who have not experienced a stroke um, and would be on par for age, sex, and geographic location Researchers found that the group who did not experience early complications had significant higher risk of long-term complications than the controls. By year one past the initial event, by year one past the initial event, 9.5% of the population of post-stroke patients had experienced an adverse event such as another stroke, heart attack, or admission to long-term care or death. Right? Um, 10%, just under. Um, so in the States, that'd be 70,000 people in Canada. I don't know the number off the top of my head, but in, by using those American numbers of 795,000, that's almost 80,000 people being in the first year, right? Either having another stroke, having a heart attack, being admitted to a long-term care facility or passing away. The proportion of people who experienced adverse events increased to 23.6% at three years and 35% at five years. Now, we've talked about, yeah, you might have another stroke. And it's a potentiality. It's something you have to live with. It is now part of your new normal. And I'm not in any way trying to say you need to live in fear. You need to like build a fort 
in a tent out of blankets and you need to hide in your bed. Uh, and you know, you need to batten up your doors and don't go in the world. I'm not saying that at all. I'm just saying you now have to live more responsibly, right? You have to live more meaningfully. You have to live more deliberately, right? You have to be thoughtful about what you've been through and what you could go through. You have to be mindful about what helped bring about your first stroke and you have to be deliberate about not allowing that to happen again. And we'll get into my experience once I get through all of this. So one, if you smoke, quit. Simply smoking doubles your chance of the general population of having another stroke. The last cigarette I had was 90 minutes before my stroke. Initially, I was on the scared shitless plan, like full on, fuck that, I don't want to die, I don't want another cigarette. Um, is that to say that I haven't had cravings? No, that's not to say that I haven't had cravings. Is that to say that I have not, you know, really wanted a cigarette a couple of times? No, there's probably been five times where I've really wanted a cigarette, haven't done it. Full on, haven't done it, don't want to do it, because I, uh, I have to accept the fact that I can minimize the potentiality of me having another stroke by not smoking. So if I was going to be 10% of the population that might have another adverse event within the first year of my stroke, but by smoking, I now double that. So that I now become 20%. Stop smoking. You're now back down to 10%, right? And by quitting smoking and maintaining the cessation of cigarettes and tobacco products and even vaping. What are you doing? Oh, thank you ever so much. So you have to pause this. He uh, decided to be a dirty bird. Okay, back again. So just by quitting smoking, I've now reduced my potentiality of having another stroke. Managing your high blood pressure. Now, that can mean many things. That can be watching your diet. That can be working out again. That could be um, managing your weight. There are many things you can do to manage high blood pressure. That could be taking Tai Chi, going to yoga, meditation, whatever you need to do for you that works to help manage your high blood pressure. Great. Do that. Right? Um, high blood pressure is the most important modifiable risk factor for stroke. People who have high blood pressure have at least one and a half times the risk of having a stroke. Well, if you're already in the 9.5% that could potentially have another stroke, and you're now one and a half times more likely to have another stroke because of your high blood pressure, why, why elevate that option, right? Why elevate it? Manage your high blood pressure. Whatever you need to do to do that, be it you need to start going to the gym just to, you know, have a release of energy. You need to manage your diet and lose weight. You need to start meditating. You need to go to yoga. You need to, you know, whatever that is, just go ahead and do it. Um, then we get into medications. This is the one that really I'm not currently liking that much. I'm on five medications, right? Don't like it. One of them is for the anxiety um, and my headaches, like one of them is as a medication specifically for my anxiety and my headaches and whatnot. And, and I take that as a, as needed in the medical community, which is known as a PRN. Um, and then the rest of them are either to deal specifically with my stroke or side effects from the medica medications of my stroke. Could you not do that? Like right now, is there not a better time for that? So take your medications. Right? Research shows at least a quarter of stroke survivors stop taking one or more of their prescribed stroke medications within the first three months. I realize every morning you're going to get up and you're going to have to take a small handful of medication. I realize that that gets tedious. I realize that gets frustrating. I realize that feels hobbling. I realize if you're fairly young, that makes you feel ridiculously old. I understand all of that. Um, but I also understand that if I stop taking my medications, without suitable advice and or replacement from either my neurologist or a cardiologist or my general practitioner, I'm now elevating my chance of having another stroke, having a heart attack, you know, dying. I understand that. So I 
I begrudgingly religiously take my medications. Managing your high cholesterol, right? So managing your high cholesterol, that'll help with the plaque buildup in your arteries. Again, managing your high cholesterol can go right back to high blood pressure. Right. So you're watching what you eat. You're watching your diet. You're, you know, you're cutting out the junk food, you know, bag of chips every so often. Right. Having a movie night, chocolate bar every so often. Not a big deal. Bowl of ice cream every so often. Not a big deal. But if you're on a rather healthy diet of Arby's and um, In-N-Out Burger and McDonald's and Wendy's and Subway and Pizza Hut, eh, stop it. Like this, it's not a good thing. And then the last one. Diabetes. You got the diabetes, right? So if you happen to have diabetes, you got to keep the diabetes under control, right? Now, is it type 1, type 2? Highly irrelevant, right? The fact that you have diabetes now makes you four times more likely to have someone or have a stroke than someone that does not have the diabetes. So think about it. If you have diabetes, you can't control the fact that you have the diabetes. You're, you're never not going to be a diabetic. It's like unringing a bell. You can control and manage your symptoms of the diabetes, and you can do that through diet and medication and exercise and activity, right? By managing your diet, by managing your exercise, right, by managing your activity, right, that'll also help control your high cholesterol, that'll also help control your high blood pressure. So right there, you can literally kill three birds with one stone. Didn't like that joke? So, if you can kill three birds with one stone, really doesn't like that joke, um, you can then manage your diabetes, your cholesterol, and your high blood pressure simultaneously. Then you just have to worry about your medications. Well, if you're already a diabetic, you're probably used to taking your insulin or other medications on a daily basis or an as-needed as basis. And I realize that you don't want to have to pick up a handful of pills every morning or every afternoon or whatever the case may be. I get that that's tedious as fuck. And then, once we get into eat a healthy diet and physical activity, we've already touched on those. If you can eat a healthy diet and you can maintain your physical activity, you can manage your blood pressure, you can manage your diabetes, you can manage your cholesterol. And then the last one is the booze or drugs, right? So we're going to talk about alcohol specifically. Um, there are some studies that indicate that more than two drinks per day can increase your stroke risk by 50%. Right? I was told by my neurologist, I'm good for three drinks a day, no more than 14 a week. Right? Um, how many drinks have I had since my stroke? Since June? Maybe 12. Maybe. And that's a guess. Right? Out with drinks for friends, out with dinner for friends, you know, over to friends' house for Thanksgiving or whatever. I've had a beer, a glass of wine here and there, right? So if you can control your alcohol and your tobacco, right? And for me, alcohol and tobacco are co co comorbid. Um, if I was out for a pint with my mates, I'd have cigarettes. That's just as simple as it gets. Yeah. Uh, so just take everything I've said during this video and use it to your own advantage. I realize that not everything is going to apply to every individual because not everyone's diabetic, not everyone has the high cholesterol, not everyone has high blood pressure, not everyone needs to lose weight, not everyone's a smoker or a drinker. But you need to, once you've had your first stroke, you need to seriously sit down and examine your life. You need to seriously sit down and determine what, what's the root cause of why I had a stroke. Why did my brain just try to kill me? And then you need to find the best medically reasonable and responsible ways to stop that from happening again. And if you like what you've been watching over the last nine months, please like, share, subscribe with your friends. If you know someone that's going through their own post-stroke journey or you're supporting someone that's going through their post-stroke journey, please point the channel out to them. They might enjoy what they're watching. Uh, and if you happen to notice either in yourself or someone around you the signs or symptoms of a stroke, that being someone who appears to be immediately befuddled, confused, uh, just bewildered. They don't have a sense of balance. Someone who has vision problems. They see in grayscale. They can't move their eyes in one direction. They see the world in just a little dot. Uh, someone who has facial droop. Someone who can't raise both arms equally effectively or at all. Someone who can't smile equally effectively or at all. Someone who's having speech problems or slurring, stuttering their speech. Inappropriate word usage for situation or context. 
Someone who has general body weakness, weakness on one side, has the inability to stand unaided, please immediately place that person in a position of comfort and dial 911. Something so simple can save a life.